there is mystery enshrouding the very existence of Buddhist nuns. Even though they have existed for more than 2,500 years, from the time of Buddha, most people in the West are not even aware of their presence in the world. Only recently, nuns have started to travel and teach, even though in very small numbers. Buddha lived from approximately 563 BC to 483 BC. He gathered many thousands of followers in his time. They were mostly male, but he also attracted many female followers. One of them was Pajapati Gotami, who was Buddha's aunt and also his stepmother who raised him after his mother Maya died a few days after his birth. Pajapati was a woman ahead of her time, and she was a very religious and devout woman. She approached the Buddha and asked him to be accepted into the Sangha, the community of Buddhist monks at the time. To her surprise, Buddha said, no. Pajapati, now even more determined, along with 500 women followers, all ladies of the court, used to a life of comfort, cut off their hair, dressed themselves in monks' robes, and decided to follow Buddha wherever he would go. Seeking help, Pajapati went to Buddha's cousin and friend, Ananda, telling him how she was refused ordination. Uh, when the Buddha's aunt, Mahapajapati, go to me, she and her 500 court ladies requested ordination from the Buddha, and he was very hesitant to give it, I think, because in those days it was very early days, there were no nunneries or monasteries. How could you have 500 court ladies wandering around begging for food barefoot? Ananda compassionately agreed to help the women and talk to Buddha about accepting women into the order. However, Buddha was unyielding and said no again. Finally, Ananda asked if there was any reason women could not realize enlightenment and enter nirvana as well as men could, since in essence there is no difference between men and women. His cousin Ananda um, tried to persuade the Buddha on behalf of his uh, uh, aunt to ordain women, and when the Buddha was again hesitant to do so, he asked the Buddha, well, are women capable of liberation or not? And the Buddha said, well, of course they're capable. And he said, so why are you not allowing them to go forth? And then the Buddha said, okay. This is how Pajapati and 500 ladies of the court became the first nuns. But it is said in the scriptures that Buddha predicted that because of allowing women into Sangha, this would cause the teachings to survive only half as long, 500 years instead of 1,000. 2,500 years later, Buddhism is still alive and thriving. But this statement, that teaching will last 500 years, shorter because of women, was often used in the past and today is an alibi to deny nuns ordination, spiritual teachings, and proper living conditions. Throughout history, there have been extraordinary female practitioners, um, and I don't see that their level of attainment was in any way inferior to the males. There is an ancient question in Buddhism. Is there a difference between men and women in their ability for spiritual development? However, many old Buddhist texts mention a preference of the male body in order to reach enlightenment. Many masters have uh, observed that women have a natural potential uh, for meditation and for uh, spiritual interests because of the way that women are naturally usually more intuitive and more, more at home in, in the spacious openness of the mind. The female are more faithful for a spiritual practicing in the, this, this, uh, this uh, planet. Uh, so, far, so far I have seen many places that the majority of the number of female 
to attending for the teachings and uh, all spiritual activity and also to, to doing for the others, serving to the others, the more female than men. Well, certainly women are often more interested. I mean, as we know, if you visit any Dharma center in the West, two thirds of the people there are women. In fact, if you took away the women, the Dharma centers would close. Monasteries in India greatly outnumber the nunneries. There is a long waiting list for potential nuns to join the nunneries. They come as refugees from Tibet, but they also come from the Himalayan regions of India, such as Zanskar, Ladakh, and Arunachal Pradesh. Many of them want to get a better education that isn't available in their homeland and to be closer to His Holiness Dalai Lama in Dharamsala. Kesan Yujin is one of those nuns. Originally from Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh, a Buddhist community of the Monpa nation who speak their own language. Tawang is known for the largest monastery building after Lhasa in Tibet. Kesan had to learn Tibetan first. It is a very difficult language with a distinct alphabet and grammar. Usually, nuns learn it first for two years, but it takes much longer to be able to join the Buddhist philosophy debate, which is an everyday requirement in the Buddhist education system. あ、ここまで
ちえ、あ、ひしのねねがじ、天下ですか、カシュインスカジネ。で、で、ノムジシで操もやたね。で、しんどでず操もやえ、え、彼のまでぞやきしね。で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で
nuns gathered from different nunneries in India and for the first time in history debated in front of His Holiness Dalai Lama. The phenomenon of goddesses is very strong in Tibetan Buddhism. There are powerful and delicately ornated feminine deities present in every Tibetan temple. There is Tara, the goddess of long life, skillful means and protection. Prajna Paramita, perfection of wisdom goddess. Vajra Yogini, the diamond female yogi whose practice gives liberation from death. There are mystical Dakinis, female sky travelers who are the embodiment of enlightened energy and who appear only to deserving meditators. In Buddhism, there are many female and male deities who are all perceived as embodiments of the enlightened energy of Buddha. The Buddha has such amazing qualities that are totally beyond our comprehension, really. Amazing love, compassion, skillful means, and so forth. And they are, they are uh, depicted in the form of, or it is said that the Buddha's qualities manifest in the form of uh, different Buddha figures or deities, if you like, like the official term is deities, but they're kind of like aspects of the Buddhas. So as you find, for example, the, the great compassion of the Buddhas manifest in the form of Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion, or the, the wisdom aspect is, for example, uh, Manjushri, it's one of the wisdom aspects. And so the skillful means, the, the swift actions of a Buddha, is manifested in the form of a female uh, Buddha figure called Tara. In Tibetan society, Tara is very much worshipped, especially when someone uh, needs to do some important work and, and um, faces possibly some obstacles to accomplishing that, that uh, work. So they usually make special requesting prayers to Tara. Buddhas are beyond being male or female in specific. I mean, they're both, they're complete males and complete female. It would be us who are incomplete in our being a woman or being a man. It is interesting how Western women feel closeness to such female deities and have a high level of identification. In Asia, however, those deities are regarded as high beings with divine powers and people do not associate with them much on a personal level. Western people feel um, a lack of the feminine and uh, input in, in Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, almost no books are written from the feminine point of view. One of the main obstacles nuns face in their education is lack of time for learning due to the obligation to do many Tara Pujas. A lot of nuns, or the, in the nunneries usually, they, they do the, the Tara prayers as one prayer to the 21 different aspects. It's not just one Tara, there's 21 different aspects that are um, worshipped in this, this specific prayer that is recited a lot in the monasteries and nunneries, actually everywhere, but I guess there's more emphasis in the nunneries on this practice. These ritual prayers traditionally remove obstacles, grant health and long life, and help in business and finances. It is very popular among lay people and they come to the nunnery every day requesting the prayers. Pujas are the main source of income in most monasteries and nunneries around the world. Teacher Gyatso from Ganden Choling Nunnery is well aware of the problems nuns face due to a limited time for studying. 
Women in Buddhism had to struggle throughout history to get access to the teachings and to be respected among monks as equals. Exile from Tibet has actually helped the nuns' education and living conditions. In India, they founded new nunneries and raised the quality of teachings. In this endeavor, several Western nuns are helping their Tibetan sisters, merging their Western know-how with ancient traditions. One of the founders is Tenzin Palmo, a prominent British nun. She arrived to India and became a nun in 1964. She is also one of the rare women who meditated for 12 years in a cave. When I lived with my, my community, which also were mostly monks and lay people, um, they didn't really know what to do with me. And uh, I didn't fit into any particular slot. So as a result, it was very difficult to actually learn anything because in those days also, these were the early 60s, there was almost nothing about Tibetan Buddhism in Western languages. And um, the Lamas themselves had no idea how to teach Westerners what would be appropriate, what would not be appropriate. A similar experience comes from Kesan Wangmo, a nun of German origin and the first nun in history to acquire a Geshe degree. I mean, it was difficult. I mean, they were definitely accepting to some degree, but the problem was, of course, them being monks, and they did not want to be around women. They didn't want to, didn't want to be with uh, another woman so or with another nun. Uh, so it was a bit lonely at times. I was on my own. They would be very friendly with each other, but it wasn't appropriate to go and see them oftentimes. So we had some contact on the debate ground in class, but then they were also shy around me. and. They were accepting of me, but it was just, they were not used to it, having another woman around them, and on top of that, foreigner. However, the position of nuns has changed significantly in the last decades. The position of nuns has, um, all over the Buddhist world, really, has taken a great leap forward. I mean, they still have a long way to go compared with the monks, but now, there are especially, most especially, the opportunity for education. This is the, the biggest um, advance that they have made. The ordination of nuns must traditionally take place under the authority of both monks and nuns from a given lineage. Originally, when Shantarakshita and Guru Padmasambhava and the King Tutsundetsan invited monks into Tibet in the 8th century to give ordination, um, and start the lineage in Tibet, they didn't invite any nuns. <laughs> the fact that many lines of nuns have died out completely makes them impossible to re-establish. Right now, there's no way we can give full ordination for Tibetan nuns, also other nuns. But it doesn't mean, you know, we don't want to give the full ordination for Tibetan nuns. We really love to give, but there's, we don't have the, uh, uh, we don't have the condition now. Sometimes nuns travel to different countries in order to receive ordination. But the authority of such ordinations has been the source of controversy because they are said to threaten the purity of a particular school of Buddhism. Because they don't have full ordination, they cannot study the monastic text called the Vinaya. Because they cannot study, they are not allowed to study the text because they have not got that level of ordination, they cannot be examined on it. Because they are not examined on it, therefore they cannot be considered to have passed onto the rank of the Geshe. However, there is a worldwide effort in order to re-establish the Bhikshuni ordination with full support of His Holiness Dalai Lama. The best countries for nuns is undoubtedly those who uh, receive the Chinese ordination lineage, which means China, 
uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, there they have fully ordained nuns uh, who are highly educated and highly trained and highly disciplined. And in fact, normally they have far more nuns than they have monks. Um, in the Theravadan countries, such as uh, Thailand and Burma, um, the status of nuns is even worse than in Tibet because they don't even receive um, the monks' ordination, which nuns do in Tibet. Besides ordination issues, nuns face many cultural obstacles that prevent them from making more progress. Having ambition in studying can be interpreted as egotistic. If it is the desire, a strong desire to become really good in your studies, to become an accomplished nun for your own purpose alone, then that would be selfish. But I think if this ambition or this strong desire to be good in one's studies and uh, become engaged possibly, if it's for the benefit of others, for the benefit of others, then I, I don't think it's something selfish. Buddhist nuns have often been denied the teaching in the premonition that ambition in study raises one's ego. One lama said to me when I was saying, what a pity there were so few biographies of women practitioners in Tibetan Buddhism. And he said, no, it's good for them, because if people write your biography, you become proud. In Tibetan culture, women are raised to be shy, obedient, and are often not encouraged to get an education. My sister wanted to go to school with me in Zanskar, in local school. My parent rejected to send her to school. And because in, in, in generally, in India, especially in Ladakh, the man and boy has more opportunity to make money, money and go to different places. Very few girls usually go to school. The Geshema degree, an equivalent of a doctorate in Buddhist philosophy, is traditionally given by three major monasteries, Sera, Drepung and Ganden, that are situated in South India. For the first time in history, in 2011, this degree was given to a woman, a Western nun of German origin, Kesang Wangmo. It was given from the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics in Dharamsala, which is presided by His Holiness Dalai Lama. This was the first time this institute gave the Geshe degree, besides three other major monasteries. The reason I'm actually at the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics is that Many years ago, um, it was actually only monks and laymen who were allowed to study at the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics, Tibetan laymen uh, and monks. Um, and then a foreign nun, she wanted to join uh, an institution to study and the nunneries were fully occupied. It was impossible for the nuns to take on someone else. And so this nun, she requested His Holiness the Dalai Lama. She went to have an audience with His Holiness. And since His Holiness is the official head of the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics, um, he gave her permission. It takes a long time to become a Geshe, usually from 15 to 20 years of study. The Geshe exam itself takes six years to complete. It's a very long uh, program. It took about 17 years to complete it. And so to, yeah, work really hard, make sure I don't miss any classes, don't mi do miss any debate sessions. Um, especially because coming from a different cultural background, coming from a different country, I had to first learn Tibetan, um, learn the culture, understand the culture. So there was a lot of initial, a lot of difficulty understanding and, and um, understanding what was going on, understanding my teachers. Um, on top of that, I was the only woman in my class. So it was difficult. Nuns would have to show persistence and determination in order to become Geshema. But also, they need proper conditions from the official education system. And sooner or later, I think the Tibetan government, as well as the Dalai Lama, the, the, I don't know, the Gelugpa um, organization, they will 
grant the Geshe degree to the nuns who have completed their studies. Tibetan Buddhism is very orthodox and based on traditional lineages. Many lamas and geshes find it hard to accept novelties, such as the Geshe degree for women, or new establishments that award them. In native Tibet, there were almost no opportunities for nuns to study Buddhist philosophy. But today, nuns are getting better in their education. It is surprising that nuns in Ganden Cholin nunnery, situated only 300 meters away from the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics, had never heard of the first nun becoming Geshema. I suppose the reason why they haven't heard that I uh, received this Geshe degree is, is because, well, first of all, I'm a foreigner, I'm not a Tibetan, so if anything concerns a Tibetan, it's a lot more news uh, in the Tibetan community, of course. And on top of that, it's also a little controversial because this is the first time that an institution other than Jopo and Gan and Sarah have given the degree. Many lamas and teachers support the idea of nuns receiving the Geshe Ma degree. Uh, after this uh, Geshe, many Geshe's uh, come out of the nuns, non Geshe, then they can take the position of the, the abbot of the nunneries. That could be nice. That was my wish. Gesa Nyujan spends her days studying and praying. Sometimes she thinks about the future but not very often. Usually she is focused on today's chores. In the Buddhist way of thinking, one should not have many desires. But Kesang values strongly the motivation to be helpful to others, and she tries to do it the best she can in everyday life. <laughs> There is plenty of advice for young nuns. They have to overcome their cultural conditioning and to show determination in changing centuries-old traditions. Well, I, I think the advice for nuns uh, within a traditional society would be to affiliate themselves first with a good nunnery so that they can be properly trained and to recognize that in the past their subservient position was due to the fact of a lack of opportunity. That um, they weren't given the kind of training and education which they could use to f open up their, their full potential. Well, I don't think there's much of a difference in terms of like being able to do it. I, I believe anyone who works hard can do it. 
Um, they have the advantage, of course, that it's their own native language, so it would be much easier for them, uh, especially initially, to understand the teacher, to understand the concepts. And my advice would just be to do it and not to give up. And I believe they can do it just as well as the monks can do it. In Asia, it's a little difficult because we have very culture force on the women. So like my advice, usually I have been give advice for many nuns, even my sister. You should, you have to be shy some areas, not always. Studying with this philosophy, you don't have to be shy. You have to study very hardly. When you have ability to test the, pass the exam, you should, shouldn't be shy to go in Sarah and Dribu Garden should debate with monk, should take the exam in, in the Gilup Monastery School. So when we talk about that, most of the nuns, I don't think they have sort of determination to want to do the exam. You know, we don't say you don't have to be shy anywhere. Some part we need to be shy, but some part we don't have to be shy. They need a little more strong sort of sense of I, I could learn, you know, I could do. The future seems better for Buddhist nuns than it did a couple of decades ago. However, there are still many problems to resolve. But the Dharma, spiritual teachings, work in mysterious ways. Perhaps in the future, there will be many more female geishas teaching in the nunneries and around the world. Even the misfortunate event of the exile of Tibetans from their country aided the spread of the teachings around the world. Perhaps now, coming back from the West, the teachings renewed with a new energy will help the awakening of the sleeping goddess. Now they are permitted to study the texts which um, traditionally they had no access to and also to um, undertake more extended retreats and to practice more profound practices than they had been uh, traditionally normally uh, given the opportunity for. So their whole sense of self-worth has um, increased enormously. <laughs> Thank you.